Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, everyone, and welcome to the next FPNA Trends webinar. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and being part of our global FPNA community. And when I say global, I mean it. Today we had uh, fantastic registrations from 68 countries on six continents. Uh, let me remind you uh, that the main mission of FPNA Trends webinar is to share with you the latest trends in developments in modern financial planning and analysis. And we believe that the trends are truly global uh, and they are agnostic uh, by industry, country or vendor. And today's webinar is about uh, the power of collaborative planning at the McDonald's division at the Coca-Cola company. And this is the real thing and the real case study. My name is Larissa Malnichuk. Uh, I'm CEO and Managing Director of uh, FPNA Trends Group and International FPNA Board. A quick reminder about the agenda. So uh, a quick introduction to collabor collaborative planning and uh, then a case study that will be delivered by uh, C4, Victor Barnes. Then conclusions and recommendations and Q&A session. And before we start, I would like to say thank you so much to our webinar sponsor, Anaplan, uh, the company that provides a flexible FPNA solution and drives faster and more effective connected planning and decision making uh, through modern technology. This is the time of introductions. Uh, our speakers and facilitators. So we have uh, Victor Barnes, who is global CFO at the McDonald's division at the Coca-Cola company. Uh, Victor is a digital CFO, visionary and storyteller and coach as well. And he has over 30 years of experience in multiple industries, markets and cultures. Currently, he is responsible uh, for the McDonald's division at Coca-Cola company, and he reports directly to the company's CEO. Uh, it's amazing, but within a year of Victor's arrival uh, at this division, the team is digital pace setter with the company, delivering the right data to decision making and uh, collaborative planning. This is the center of, of this uh, success. Uh, Victor? Welcome to FPNA Trends webinars. It's such a pleasure to have you here as a speaker. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you. Uh, and I would like to introduce uh, our webinar facilitator, Jan Hill. And Jan is uh, uh, at Anaplan Accelerate team, where she's a principal. Uh, she, helps, she helps customers to unco uncover transformation opportunities through connected planning framework. Jen holds 12 years of professional experience across the finance function, and previously she worked at the finance strategy service of Deloitte Consulting. She holds a BA uh, in mathematical economic analysis from Rice University in Houston. Jen, welcome to the FPNA Trends webinar. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you so much. And a quick introduction of my background. So I'm CEO and um, founder at FPNA Trends Group and International FPNA Board. Uh, I'm based in the UK, British Qualified Accountant. Uh, I manage FPNA at different organizations before creating my own company. Just very briefly, an uh, introduction uh, to our global project. Uh, it's amazing, but exactly four years ago, International FPNA Board went outside of London, uh, and the first opening was in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, and then uh, over the next four years, uh, we traveled the world and we opened chapters at 27 cities, 16 countries, and four continents. Uh, about collaborative planning, uh, it's always uh, one of the biggest trends. And I would say that uh, it's definitely a huge trend right now when majority of us are working from home and when I, our teams are uh, anywhere in the world. So collaborative planning, this is such an important concept for us. And I would like to start this webinar with uh, a fantastic quote, uh, which is coming from um, uh, basket, uh, American basketball legend Michael Jordan, talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence win championships. The reason why uh, I uh, decided to use this quote at the beginning, because it's not only a fantastic description of um, 
collaborative FP&A uh, co collaborative planning, but also uh, our today's speaker, Victor, uh, has the status of elite level basketball coach, where he mastered the art of collaboration and uh, winning as a team. So let us start. And this is a good timing now to give uh, the microphone uh, to Victor and to Jan. Victor and Jan, you are welcome. Thank you, Larissa. And thank you to everyone on the line for joining today's webinar on collaborative planning. I think usually we would start off by saying, you know, why focus on the topic? Why, why talk about collaborative planning? What's the challenge? What are the pain points? But I know that many of you on the line, um, as part of the FPNA Trends community, are living and working this, you know, every every single day. So the need to proactively respond to changes in the forecast and the plan, provide insights, even as the business becomes more and more complex. I think for a lot of us, the past three months, uh, especially, have revealed that need for organizations to be more agile. Um, collaborate virtually across regions, across functions, um, and respond to you know, any changes in, in real time. So we're very fortunate to have Victor with, here with us today, um, who recognized that need for, for collaboration and, and agility you know, a few years ago. Um, he's made tremendous impact at uh, the McDonald's division of the Coca-Cola company. So we're all very fortunate to, uh, to be able to hear that story um, on today's webinar. So, Victor, let's let's start at the beginning of your journey. Um, okay. you know, when you realized there was a need to transform the way that that planning happened. Well, thank you, uh, Jan, and thanks to the FBNA Trends for this opportunity. Uh, but before I go on a little further, I want to make sure I also thank um, Larissa for that promotion she gave me because my boss actually reports to the CEO, um, and I report to him. But I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, I did not get that promotion. But um, I am happy to be here to discuss uh, collaborative planning. Um, this page here that we're going to advance to in a moment is foundational to the conversation that we're going to have if we'll advance that first slide. So I've been with the Coca-Cola company for now 25 and a half years, and I joined this particular team in December of 2018. And we'll talk a little bit more about the journey uh, a little later. but I'll land here first. In April of 2019, looking at the left side of this slide, our CEO had a conversation with the uh, global uh, Coca-Cola family, and it was after our Q1 results. And he talked about the growth stages of the Coca-Cola company. And the first growth stage was one product, that eight ounce glass in one country. And then we moved to growth stage two with that same eight ounce glass in multiple countries. That was uh, near or, or around World War II. Growth stage three, and this is a quote from James Quincy, is where many companies fail. And that's when you have, in the case of the Coca-Cola company, we have 500 plus brands, over 200 markets. And that was a great aha moment for me. And that was, a, a few months into the beginning of our journey. And the thing I want to focus on here is when you're going through change and trying to really get the organization to rally behind something so important as collaborative planning, there has to be a strong, compelling reason why. And I thought that the CEO's conversation to our organization was a, bit, a big rallying cry with regards to why we really need to have a networked organization with the ability to connect with one another, to import and export ideas and or brands. And on the right side of this page, another key defining moment or aha moment for me, it was near the beginning of the year and one of our enterprise IT leads was having a conversation, uh, Jan, with us about what is digital transformation for the Coca-Cola company. And in this, conversation, she spoke about the fact that it is three things. It is externally to grow with our consumers. You can think of things like social engagement or uh, physical to um, e-commerce. It is externally to grow with customers. Uh, who among us have not used Amazon this 
uh, uh, last three months. While I was with an organization, with our bottling organization about a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago, when we first hosted a Skunk Works team talking about how to sell our products on Amazon site. And then last but not least, internally to be agile, productive, and engaging. And I've explained to my uh, finance team that this is where uh, enabling functions sit, such as finance, and this is where we were going to make a big difference, but it was in support of those first two. So based on the two things you see on this slide, I really felt that I had a strong foundation. Now, again, the journey had begun, but like many journeys, you're still searching for, am I headed in the right direction? Do I have the great foundation that I need to really propel? And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, we go ahead. Absolutely, and, and coming from a management consulting background, um, you know, the word transformation certainly gets gets used quite a bit, especially in these you know large and complex organizations. But you know over time, as that growth has happened, um, you know you have more and more complex processes that have changed. So certainly, as you said, a journey, um, not a a thing that just happens overnight, right? A rapid rapid change effort. Um, I think exactly. that a lot of a lot of those on the line uh, have probably embarked on on such a journey or or thought about it and you know have looked back and and realized there were some success factors that that could have helped right up front. I know you you had a few of those as you went exactly. through. Um, so let's start with a um, a polling question just to to hear from our participants today, you know, on their experiences. Uh, I'm opening the polling question right now, uh, and I would like uh, to ask people to start uh, uh, to start voting so it's launching and you can start voting uh, on the polling question uh, and let me read this polling question which is the most critical for success uh, at finance transformation so please can you choose one of those is it aligning on the objectives and scope is it bringing other functions uh, on the journey is it training and upskilling the finance team or overcoming uh, cultural resistance to change so i can see that uh, less than 50 percent of you voted yet uh, so please continue to vote uh, when uh, more than 50 percent more than 60 percent will be uh, voting we will close the poll and we will share the results Please continue. It's more than 55%, and I'm about to close the poll. So it's more than 60% of your vote, the majority of you now. I'm closing the poll and I'm sharing uh, the results with everyone. So you can see that uh, 38%, uh, the first one, 21, uh, 12, uh, 30%. The results are on the screen. Please, would you like to comment on this, Jan and Victor? Yes, absolutely. So it's it's probably not surprising to see that you know each one of these success factors is important up front um, to ensure the success of a of a transformation, and certainly aligning on the objectives and and the scope um, as a as a primary success factor before you begin to bring other functions on the journey and um, you know and start to gain that adoption uh, throughout. Victor, I think probably you know maybe all of these um, were some lessons that, that right. you learned up front. Absolutely. And uh, it's not surprising to see uh, that we do have a, a spread of, of choices here with a overabundance on two, which is around objectives and scope and, and, and culture. Um, from my standpoint, and one of the things that uh, I've talked about with, with many when I've had a conversation about transforming it is three key things that i've seen um, which is underutilized resources many companies have the ability to make change but for whatever reason haven't embarked on it um, a not invented here uh, kind of uh, approach sometimes when people don't necessarily adopt something that it wasn't their idea and the last but not least resistance to change which can be basically a cultural norm so uh, thank you for uh, uh, your responses on this result on this survey and um, I'm I'm sure many have dealt with many of these particular items and what I want to talk about right now is how I've worked through some of the things that one deals with with regards to change and uh, so if we advance to the next slide 
we'll break those down and we'll spend a little time about this. And I'm gonna go straight to the bottom of this slide first, which is something that many of you may have seen or heard this quote from Peter Drucker, the famed management consultant, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And um, I added that little last bit there and finance transformations for lunch. And I'll just go through each of these particular items that you see here with a little bit more focus on allies, which you might wonder what that one is, but uh, for us, choices. So again, um, I'll, I'll speak a bit about the organizational structure of my team. Um, we support the McDonald's division. Um, McDonald's um, and Coca-Cola operate together in 105 markets, which is about half the countries in which Coca-Cola sells its products. And um, about half of our business is based in the US. So we had to make choices at the very beginning with regards to where we were going to focus. And it was clear that we had some challenges with having an effective uh, planning process for the markets outside the US. One, many of those markets are developing, but then just a the sheer number of people who have inputs with regards to what we do. Over 70 finance people worldwide, over 100 um, finance, I'm sorry, 100 salespeople worldwide. And so the focus around where to uh, ch uh, choose to uh, put our effort was on primarily the international business initially while bringing along the rest of the people on the, on the journey with regards to the work we're going to do. Allies. This one is one where I could not have predicted, uh, Jan, that this was going to be so important. And as many people know, as most of you know, Coca-Cola is quite a large organization and the layers of, 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 of manual work have been taking place for a generation. I started my finance um, career 30 years ago and Coke, as I said earlier, 25 years ago and Excel was the mantra. So a few allies within the organization who saw and believed there was a better way, we've been a great support system to one another and able to kind of uh, adapt or adopt some of the practices and ideas from each other all around how we bring to life this ability to collaborative collaboratively plan. With regards to scope, ferociously guarding the scope. Again, 38% of the people thought that that was important. And as we'll see in a couple of slides, we'll talk about the journey and the need to be able to actually produce some output within a short period of time is so much connected to scope. And last but not least, talent. Talent relates to the fact that if the people that are going to bring this to life don't see what's in it for them, that they're going to learn new skills that are valuable, that they're going to be working with some of our partners or, and or consultants or people across the business, such as the allies that are going to help us to bring this to life, they need to be able to see that they're, they're going to get something out of this from a, from a talent perspective or upskilling themselves and becoming more valuable. So the, the, the final point I'll make on this is with regards to the finance transformation, I've said many times to my team, it obviously should impact our division, the McDonald's division, and our ability to plan more effectively and, 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 and collaborate across the enterprise. It should definitely impact the Coca-Cola company. And, and people would say, what do you mean Coca-Cola company? I, well, we, we're in 105 markets. What we do will get seen. And it absolutely should affect you as an individual. Yeah, I think that, that what's in it for me point um, is, is critical to ensure that adoption and ensure that you have allies along the way. Um, when I think about bringing in the allies as well, another, another point comes to mind, which is getting that full picture of what you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So, so often, you know, when we work in, in silos, our, our, our small view of the world might not give you that full picture of an end-to-end -end process and the connection points. Right. And as you start to engage other functions and have those conversations, um, you know, you both walk away more informed about what the true scope of the work and the business looks like. Exactly. And Larissa, I think if we advance to the next slide, I know Victor, you had some conversations with, with IT, right? And, and some of the business partners over there as you started to, to paint that picture of what are we really solving for here? Exactly. And um, so I'll, I'll unpack this slide here because I've spent a good amount of time talking to multiple individuals about this. And on that last slide, I talked about allies. 
And one of my allies on this journey was a guy that uh, worked with Deloitte initially and then came to Coca-Cola and his responsibility was to build what we refer to as our financial data warehouse. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, many of the financial planning and analysis professionals on this tool, on this call will recognize transaction systems of record like Salesforce and um, ERP systems like SAP for transactions. The next layer, data integration, um, that is a very important layer where many corporate corporations have now put all of their data in the cloud. And I'm going to skip that middle part because that's the part I want to really emphasize the most. At the top of this, you see consolidation and reporting and HFM which stands for Hyperion Financial Management, BPC, Business Planning, Consolidation. And you also have various other consolidation tools. And on top of that stack, you have um, business intelligence tools like Tableau and MicroStrategy and Power BI, where you do dashboards and charts. What I was be trying to put my hands on is what I hope that many people on this call can relate to is this messy middle. For a generation, for a generation, we've accepted that uploading from SAP or downloading from SAP, uploading into Hyperion uh, to consolidate, and everything else gets done in Excel. Forecasts, three-year plans, ad hoc analysis, and there are multiple allies within our company that felt we could do better, and I became one of them. And this was a chart, Jan, where mm -hmm. I began to really unpack how this problem is prevalent within the Coca-Cola system. And in our case, we had a collaborative planning tool that we wanted to implement. And this was not my original idea. This was done by one of my allies and a tool that allowed us to build our long range plan in a connected way without email and Excel spreadsheets. So when I came to this team, it was a mar uh, again, 105 markets all emailing spreadsheets about plans. And I thought this is a great place to adopt this particular collaborative planning tool. So I love I love this concept of the messy middle. Um, and I think that for for a lot of those on on the call here today, um, you may not have heard the term, but but you likely recognize the problem here that's that's laid out. Um, and I know up front we said, you know, we don't need to unpack why we're talking about collaborative planning today or what the challenge is. But I do also know that I've certainly met some leaders who who haven't recognized this or or haven't necessarily understood the full magnitude of it. Right. Um, just the, the sheer amount of time that's required to to piece data together and, and answer those what if questions, you know, not mm -hmm. not a push of a button or a, uh, you know, just a single visualization dashboard or a, or a data lake. Exactly. Exactly. That is a challenge that um, I think many organizations face with the, the fancy Tableau and Power BI dashboards, the belief that you can just attach that to a data lake and have the information. But the reality is it's only going to be a static representation of whatever you've built in that dashboard, but the ability to dynamically have people at the edge of your enterprise, whether it's your sales team in the field or even a partner. Uh, one of our uh, teams in, in, in Coke North America actually built a, a forecasting tool for our parts warehouse that provides equipment for our fountain equipment and their top 20 suppliers actually collaborate with them in the cloud on the demand signal for providing more parts. There's literally a better way than emailing Excel spreadsheets that is in a very highly accepted practice today. Exactly. I was I was just thinking of that of the back and forth of of emailing spreadsheets and then trying to combine, you know, the way that you look at customers is it the same way that we categorize our customers. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly time consuming, and I know that obviously you've you've had some success in in tackling this this messy middle. Uh, but I'm curious to hear from from our participants um, if this is something that that looks familiar to to most on the call i would guess to some extent it does uh, but i think we have a, a polling question to to hear from uh, to hear from those on the line uh thank you chan thank you victor uh, i'm launching the second polling question right now so uh, uh it will be uh you will be able to vote in a moment uh, and i read this for you how does your organization um 
have this messy middle. Does the organization have a messy middle? Uh, a little bit, not anymore, not sure. We are drowning in the messy middle. So please, if you can start voting right now, uh, I can see that uh, almost half of you voted. Uh, we continue to vote. Uh, just one choice, please. Uh, more than 50% of you voted and we are about to close the poll. Please continue another two seconds. And we are closing the poll and I'm going to share the results with everyone. <laughs> we are sharing the results, yeah. Not, not surprising here, isn't it? So it will be on the screen in a moment. Um, not, not too surprising. Not too surprising, yes. Yeah, so we have we have most most teams um, drowning somehow in the messy middle, and it it may look like different what if questions or or different offline scenarios that they're running, but it looks like there are a lot of spreadsheets being being emailed back and forth. So let's absolutely eighty eight yeah. percent of the people yeah. on this call basically said it, and fifty six that is they're drowning in it. That's amazing. Exactly. It is. It is. So there's there's clearly a problem to be solved here. So let's talk a little bit about. Uh, the journey that you took then, Victor, with the McDonald's division and um, and the milestones that you, you know, achieved along the way to to knock out this messy middle. Absolutely, uh, thank you. So, this is the part where we hopefully can get into a little bit of the nuance of this journey that we're talking about on this call because. There's no magic potion necessarily because it is multiple things that has to happen. But I'll start here on the left and the lower left in December 2018. And mind you, I began this particular role that I'm in in October. I had just come from Canada where I had been the CFO of a business unit there. And um, I had a conversation with the person who hired me in the role, the, the, the business unit or division CEO. And he said that he wanted to have the division be able to function more like a BU. And that meant faster results from our international business and the ability to see it down to an operating income level quickly. I had a meeting with our, our finance lead for our largest operating uh, unit, which is the US. And he said, we want to modernize our systems. And so I must admit, I had that hypothesis that these were going to be things I'd find. And I, I, I really focus here because you see in Q1 2019, we had already arrived at a point where we were able to consolidate our results of, of our 105 markets from local currency to USD and a global volume analysis tool written by algorithm. Just math because there was there was time that was spent there that wasn't time was not productive time and the 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 point i want to make here is um as much as i understood that these might, might be things i'd find i was able to make sure that i checked in with the right people who could help support the journey and then by july of 2019 we had more focus on accurate an analytics so our um, international um, president for the McDonald's division could go to an ad hoc meeting on the fly with someone in North Latin America and ask for some historical trends and be able to get it. And we knew all that was connected to a data hub. And so I'm going to say right now, the tool that we used is a collaborative planning tool and a plan, but I don't want to over index on that in and of itself, because as I've told the CEO of Anaplan, if someone builds a better mousetrap, I'll go to it. Right now, that was the mousetrap that we we led with, and it's really paying great dividends. And it got to the point where now our leadership team is asking, we began asking us, hey, when can we see some of the um, uh, tools that you've built in Anaplan? And that speaks to adoption. Because everything we focused on, Jan, was really on um, not just building fancy new finance tools, but it was totally focused on trying to achieve an objective that was going to make our business unit um, operate more effectively and our frontline salespeople see the benefit. Absolutely. And I think, you know, just looking at the the milestones that happened after the first quarter of 2019, it's it's almost on a you know, monthly basis. 
So that upfront speed to value certainly built momentum. When did you first start having you know, other functions start to take notice and, and start to get questions about how do we get involved? I know you've mentioned adoption. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I would say probably by the time we were approaching what would have been our 2020 business planning process, we started hearing more because all of a sudden we had gotten to the point in, in August and September where we could have our first live customer level planning and scenario builder and the ability to understand the drivers and drains of every market across 105 markets, all centered on a common data hub where our our product descriptions, our monthly performance, which was going to provide the baseline for our 2020 business plan, the rates on revenue, on cost of goods sold, no reproduction of all that. All that was purpose built back in Q1 2019. And we were able to then allow our salespeople to then say, hey, if you go to this tool here in the cloud versus this Excel spreadsheet, and of course, we were able to build the tool that they would see and it would look much like they would have seen in Excel, only it was in the cloud and able to pull from the tools that we've already built and people started seeing the momentum. And we literally trained people on the fly um, just before plans were needed, needed, needed to be submitted. And by November, our CEO was able to present to the company CEO a business plan for 2020, representing all 105 of our markets, which is the first time ever for the McDonald's division to be able to do that because it takes so long generally in the past to collect all those spreadsheets. Right, and that, that efficiency is something that I speak with a lot of finance organizations about. Um, when it comes to transforming, you know, being able to do things faster is, is in a lot of ways the first step, that foundational element. Exactly. And, and I know that I, I see in the first quarter of this year um, a milestone around you know, deeper customer insights, which once you've built that, that foundational efficiency, yes. You free up time and and you have the ability then to you know tackle tackle what if questions or um, insights that previously were were too manual you know too time consuming to do. Um, That's correct. So it's interesting to to hear a little bit about what insights your your team has uncovered now that you have these capabilities. So one one very simple one, um, our operations vice president asked us again back to the earlier conversation about adoption. Hey, is it possible for us to connect? the quality index scores because we have people that go out to um, most of our our uh, customers outlets and look at the quality of the equipment the quality of the pour of the product and these have in the past been uh, collected in excel spreadsheets and you know looked at to see what the scores are on a scale of you know uh, zero to 100 clearly we're generally in the 90s or better but he said, can you put this in the collaborative planning tool that you built? Because I would like to be able to join that with how the actual business performance looks. We were able to have one of our key, uh, people who um, is adept on this tool to build that. And within one month, he had that tool and the, the association of quality and performance in our business is very much connected. Again, the theme here about connected planning and when you think about the messy middle that we talked about, the reason why it's so messy for so many people is that functions have traditionally been focused on point solutions fit for purpose for their function. And the reality is finance can actually lead the enterprise to think about how finance as a hub can connect to those other fit for purpose tools in a connected way such that you can leverage all of them together to bring together deeper insights, whatever your industry may be. And so what, what I was able to do in unpacking this journey, by the time we got to Q1, the sense of momentum was evident. And as, as I've, I've said to many people that I've worked with in the past, everything communicates. So it's not just a fancy diagram, it is to actually infuse in the organization a sense of momentum and progress. And it was also anchored in something that our company had said that we want to have more as 
um, a part of the way our teams and our people work, which is progress over perfection. Right, and I know when we when we first started talking about that concept, you and I, Victor, around you know progress over perfection. That's where we said, you know, truly is a journey, and and ideas you know breed new ideas. Exactly. So, in keeping with that that momentum, um, I know that you have you know a few thoughts about you know, 2020 and and beyond. Uh, what's what's next for the McDonald's division? Right. Yeah. So if you see in the upper right hand corner, you see AI, artificial intelligence, and ML, machine learning, to uh, uncover hidden value. So in January of this year, I attended a working session led by a Harvard fellow. This is a gentleman who writes business cases for the Harvard Business School. And he also founded the research firm Cancer Research. And he um, hosted an artificial intelligence and machine learning automation workshop. And he said one key thing that resonated so much with me, and that is in order to get to the place where you have a more mature, data environment and for him he said that dashboards they're good to have but they're generally descriptive of something that's already happened going up the maturity curve means you then get to predictive which is what is going to happen going up the data maturity curve even further is prescriptive which is as he said an example of walmart they are more prescriptive in their data analytics, what store to go into, what aisle, what category, what product placement should have more inventory during which day part. That's prescriptive analytics as opposed to looking at the past. So 2020 for us was looking back at the journey that we've covered so far and having a great foundational base of connecting our enterprise means we now actually can spring into the opportunity to begin to be more predictive. So if we want to uh, bring in weather with in our forecasting, we can now do that because we can layer it onto the purpose built, built uh, volume forecasting tool that we built in Q1 2020. If we want to build in um, highway closures, if there's some particular highway closure and our customer has outlets up and down a highway and that is going to be something or festival and things of this nature that's too much data for any, any human being to deal with effectively in an excel world but if you have a collect a connected planning tool that goes all the way from the most um, minute detail which is a product serving and an outlet all the way through to the operating income for market and everything's connected in between that's where we're going next that's what we're working on this year, how we run the business. 20, 2019 was more around how we plan the business. And I, I'm sure for your team too, that you know, working on that type of, of analysis is, is a bit more exciting than spending the time you know, consolidating spreadsheets and, um, and pulling different, uh, different data sources. Obviously, you're you know, a, bit, a bit farther along in this journey and, and thinking already toward prescriptive for for some of the teams who might be on on the line today they may still be thinking you know how do i get to that first milestone how do i right. how do i consolidate our pnl you know in, in in real time over the course of you know just one day instead of weeks and 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 for those folks you know, what advice or, or or what takeaways would you would you give them um to share to share the type of success that you've had Right, so if we go on to the next slide, um, this is where we'll maybe wrap up the conversation here and get to Q&A. And this is all around stewarding the journey. Um, change de definitely is difficult. No, I don't think anyone in this call would, 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 would disagree with this. And what we really opened up was the art of the possible. And so with regards to um, that, the first thing I wanna focus on here is taking the lead, but bringing your partners with you absolutely important i know there's probably not a person on this call that hasn't heard that but you may recall when i began talking about the journey and that conversation with the bu um president and um uh, a key finance lead from the largest part of our business 
making sure that you're really grounded in what needs to be done. And then the second part around educating others and broadcasting the wider benefits. I've been on a, um, a continuing um, set of conversations with people within our IT organization who um, understandably, some of them, for example, maybe only came to Coca-Cola in you know three years ago and don't necessarily have that that day-to-day -day experience dealing with the messy middle. And so their focus is around maybe ERP systems um, or um, you know consolidation systems and not necessarily around the day-to-day -day work that finance people deal with in support of our functions. It's not just about finance. And then the last part is around continuing to evolve by building on your achievements such that you know that you're not building something that's a flavor of the day. There's probably not a person on this call that hasn't seen some fancy new tool get built. And there are people who watch it and thought, yeah, this too shall pass. It's just a flavor of the day exercise. So having that sense of the journey, bringing people along and making sure that it is about progress over perfection, you can actually steward the journey and continue. That's really going to be key um, for um, actually making impactful change. And obviously impactful change is, is possible given, um, given the story at the McDonald's division. So thank you for, for sharing the journey and, uh, and the lessons learned along the way, Victor. Thank you. And Lawrence, Thank you I think so we much. Q&A. Absolutely. So uh, we're about uh, to start the Q&A session. Let me remind you that uh, you can um, type your questions via the chat box. Uh, obviously, all of this will be uh, the subject of two time constraints, but we already see a lot of questions, uh, Victor. Um, and the first one, I would like to combine two questions from our audience. The first one, how did you convince the top management that the messy middle is a huge cost and burden for the company? This is the first one. And the second one, how did you solve it to your within your organization um, that it's needed to adopt flexible and collaborative planning system? So this is the first question. Okay, thank you, Larissa. Yes, that first one, um, one of my favorite characters in the longtime television show used to say, uh, with difficulty, uh, with regards to convincing top management about this messy middle. And by that, I mean, it could not have been done in one instant. And um, so, for example, the chief information officer of the Coca-Cola company, he presented in June of 2019 to a group of global CFOs, the IT architecture roadmap. And it occurred to me that the tool of choice that we had taken on to more effectively plan collaboratively was not on that roadmap. I knew that it was important that I have the opportunity to meet with him and we have now had quarterly meetings, first just myself and members of his team, and then the last two times with my um, division boss, the person that is the CEO of our division, accompanied me into those meetings. And it was, a, 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 again, an example of progress over perfection. The first time we met, it wasn't really completely clear why we thought we needed this tool. The second time was a little bit more clear. The third time he brought some partners that work for him to help us along the journey. So that was, that was an example there because ultimately without partnership with the people who control the data integration tools, you're not going to have as much success as you would like to have. So Larissa, if you could, Help me with the second part of that. Uh, the second part uh, was about how did you solve it within your organization um, that uh, to, to, uh, the need to adopt this flexible planning solution? So this probably is more related to the ability to have a quick win and then make sure that we show the benefits being beyond finance. And, and it, again, this doesn't necessarily answer the question, but our finance organization after 2019 was voted for the award that it goes to the 
organization's most impactful project or initiative. And this can be a new launch of a frozen product in Australia or anything. And the finance team won the 2019 award voted by our leadership team. And it is grounded in the fact that we were focused on stewarding the outcome of what we were seeking to achieve in terms that was important to the leaders. It wasn't because I, I tell my teams that I've led, if you're trying to make change and the focus of the conversation is why this is important to me, then there's not going to be as much adoption. But if you can articulate and show it in ways that is important to them, that was our focus. And I, I realize that's kind of a vague answer, but it really does relate to the social and cultural aspect of change. And we spent a lot of time making sure that we really, really focused on what is it we're trying to achieve, guarding the scope very vigorously, and making sure that we were checking in with the people that we were implementing new tools for to make sure we were achieving what we sought to achieve. Thank you, Victor. Uh, another question. Uh, can you clarify if this tool is consolidating the inputs from all 105 countries, or each country uh, has itself planning, uh, has different tools? So can you clarify if it's for all of those? Yes, it is. So the our 105 markets have finance leads and the finance leads may have one or two markets that they support. So there's about 70 finance people. And when we are consolidating our results or just let's just say a business plan for 2019 or a rolling forecast, the the tool is opened up centrally. The individuals who are going to provide the input are able to go into the tool. If they're the finance person, they're providing updates and rates per case. If they're the sales person, they may be providing updates on how many of their markets outlets are open. Let's take during this COVID-19 um, scenario that we're dealing with today, how many of their outlets that are closed have drive-through or delivery? We are able to collect those types of results or, or inputs that are typically done by Excel or com com conversations in a actual fit for purpose tool. And so we are, to your question, to make sure it's real clear, absolutely collecting from all 105 markets. Amazing, thank you so much. And actually a very connected question, the next one. Uh, do you have a model that facilitates planning in different locations or countries so that Excel is not used locally in the background at all? Uh, that is that is correct. So so two key planning um, outputs we're talking about here. We're talking about the actual volume of our products that are going to be sold in markets. We're also talking about the the people costs. Like many organizations, uh, people costs are roughly two thirds of your operating expenses. And then thirdly, the the marketing expense in the markets. When we embarked on this journey in December of 2018, the mantra was, number one, by April, when we must collect our um, first forecast for the 2020 business, there will be no Excel spreadsheets coming in from the markets reporting their results. And that was, that was the goal we sought to achieve. And so with regards to our selling general and administrative expenses as well, no Excel spreadsheets in collecting the data at all zero the the next step we must take for the person who's probably asking this question did you literally eliminate excel the thing that we're working on in the background which is with our it partners is the the behind the scenes work that one must go through to figure out what's actually happening in their market sometimes requires that interaction with a system and from from the it organization that's not connected into our collaborative planning tool. And that journey uh, phase that we're in right now is to connect directly such that if you're doing a rolling forecast, the first thing you need to do is collect your actuals. We want that direct feed from SAP, which is our transaction system for actuals, directly into our collaborative planning tool. We want the finance and other people involved in the process to go into our collaborative planning tool make whatever changes they're going to make in terms of estimates for the downhill. 
And then we want to connect that directly into our global consolidation tool, which is Hyperion Financial Management. Those two integration pieces are the things we're working to complete this year. We built the middle piece, which is to receive the information. And now we're working on the second part. Again, progress over perfection. And that's a really great question because I think everyone can relate to the fact that you have to work in phases. Sometimes if you try to, um, let's say, eat the elephant in one bite, you're not going to be successful, one bite at a time. Thank you, Victor. Uh, the next question is about uh, the cycle time reduction. So how much cycle time reduction in days did you realize through this approach? Well, the first thing that we implemented which was the global roll-up of 105 markets, it went from about three months to less than three weeks. And the three weeks really relates to two weeks of giving people a window of time to input their information into the cloud, more or less. But the minute someone hits send in any of their markets, I can see in a central location what they've input. So as soon as everyone has done their job, I see instant results. So that is that is an example of a specific application that we built. And so the cycle time in terms of um, the from to depends on the various applications we're, refer we're, we're, we're talking about, but that's, that was by far the most impactful application we built. Thank you, Victor. Uh, the next question is uh, about predictive and prescriptive analytics. Uh, so many companies end up with predictive analytics, and this is the time to get prescriptive analysis uh, done. So where are you at this journey? We are at the point of getting close to the predictive analytics, and I can dimensionalize that in the comment I made earlier, where I said, we now have a, a volume forecasting tool built in our collaborative planning environment, and we're going to be adding other data points with regards to the things that impact our volume. That is going to be more predictive than what we've been able to do in the past, which was around estimated variances versus the prior year, and maybe only taking into account two variables such as the number of people walking into the outlet and the percentage of people who purchase a beverage and indirectly the size of beverage they purchase. Those are key drivers of the business, but there are so many other things as we can tell during this environment we're in right now that can impact the, the performance of a given market, especially when you are operating on every continent in the world. Thank you, Victor. Uh, the next one, uh, it's about um, what type of individuals or skills required in such finance team? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that one in two ways. In fact, one, one key person on this journey, uh, I'm going to say him by name to honor him, Danny. Danny retired. Danny had been on this team that I came to and he was my direct report um, for 20 years. And you, you might think that someone who has maybe been in a particular team for a long period of time, that you cannot achieve what you need to achieve. You need to bring in fresh new talent with new thinking. But we have a very talented team. And Danny was this example of someone who had a lot of resident knowledge and was really, really gung-ho to be able to make an impactful change. So very knowledgeable people who are passionate about doing something. And as long as the journey is simple and, and, and the ability to learn, you can get people like that. However, we also hired some fresh talent. Uh, we had the opportunity to bring in a fresh talent uh, as an example from a consulting firm who actually had more experience with this particular environment, uh, planning environment that we have. And we had some existing people within the organization who could not wait for the opportunity to be involved in some exciting projects that took them out to Jan's point earlier from that day to day and being more impactful to the organization. So we have a blend of, of talent and all of the talent is being upskilled. And the last point on this one is once we brought to the attention our, um, a member of our CEO, CIO organization 
how much work we've been doing, she then said, oh, by the way, I have a contact at Microsoft that um, because of our global contact, contract with them, can do direct training to your team on, on Power BI. So we're seeing exponential accelerating impact to the journey, and that is people leaning into uh, training opportunities even more. Thank you, Victor. Another question about your team. So what was your team size for this timeline of connected planning? We have about 20 finance professionals in total on, on this team. Thank you so much. And uh, then uh, the second question about uh, small and medium-sized companies. Uh, they need advice um, in terms if they are not, if they can't afford uh, the huge cost that they, they associate with this journey. What would be your advice? Well, let's just say that the affordability issue literally relates to no budget to buy or to uh, uh, get licenses for new tools. Then it is about the, the cultural aspect. It is about the idea that individuals across functions can collaborate more effectively and they use the resources that they have available to do so. And that is really what this FPNA trans conversation about, which is the impact of collaborative planning and making it more than just a catchphrase. Literally, with the speed of change and the way markets are operating today and competitors, there's absolutely a better way than the journey that many people started on in, you know, let's say the late 90s, in my case, um, working in Excel and believing that was the only way. You can make a, make a way to do it without some new tools, but maybe you can actually find that some of the tools available today that you thought were expensive, if you have a small operation, then you probably only need a few licenses. Thank you, Victor. Um, there are two questions about statistical volume forecasting um, methods, and it relates to your milestone number seven. So yes. what, what does statistical volume forecasting look like? Uh, is it regression analysis? Is it predictive analytics? Uh, what do you mean? So I'm going to get over my tips a little bit on this one, but the, the tool that we use, and I referred to it earlier, there are some built-in statistical models in that. So one of the allies that I talked about earlier, she had actually built a statistical um, forecast model that has 17 different uh, regression models that looks to the past and then predicts the future. And then she compares, in, when that, in that same tool is able to compare that statistical, literally looking at the past data and then projecting what the trends will be in, in, very, in 17 different regression modes is what I understood. And then comparing that to the bottoms up forecast from the salespeople and also the forecast from the bottlers, in our case, distributors, all in one place. And then looking back eight weeks to see which was the forecast was most accurate, for example, when we launch a new product and the needs there. So it literally is some, some in-the-box forecast capability, but then our job as a company was then to, to customize it based on the various input, inputs that we have. Jan, I don't know if you can speak to it better. No, I think that's that's exactly um, exactly right. And I and I actually did want to go back to um, that previous previous point around small and and medium companies um, and and the affordability factor there, because I think that speaks to that messy middle. If um, if the organization thinks about collaborative planning as a you know a once a year exercise that only affects finance, um, I think that that speaks to your point around educating, right? Tying. Right tying the business outcomes to, to the work that's actually being done. Exactly. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you so much, Victor. This is the time to conclude our webinar, but there are more questions uh, that we didn't have opportunity to answer. And uh, this is our promise. Uh, we will work on those questions and we will reply to you individually after this webinar. So now this is the time for us uh, to say thank you so much to our fantastic speakers, uh, to Victor, to Jan. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us.
uh, I would like to say thank you so much to our sponsor, Anaplan, and I would like to say thank you so much to our global FPNA community. Thank you so much for being with us. Let us continue our journey uh, to move FPNA to the better to the better place. And before, uh, when we close the webinar, uh, you will have opportunity uh, to go through survey and uh, to let us know how we can improve uh, our webinars. Let us stay connected. Let us stay together. And please uh, keep safe. Uh, the new environment is upon us, and very soon uh, we will be able to transform our FPNA functions even better. Thank you so much. All the best, everyone. Bye-bye.